Hi, I'm Jim Holmes, an orthopedic surgeon with a special interest in knee joint replacement. Chances are you're considering this operation because you have chronic pain from arthritis that causes significant limitations in your everyday activities. Our goal is to provide you with some details of knee joint replacement surgery and how it may be able to help you achieve less pain and live a more active lifestyle. This presentation covers the following topics, anatomy and arthritis, treatment options, how to know if you are a candidate, preparations for surgery, risk and potential complications, the surgical procedure, what to expect after your surgery, and post-operative rehabilitation. We urge you to review this information with family and friends, to write down any questions and concerns you may have, and to discuss these with us. As a ball and socket joint, the normal hip is capable of a wide range of motion. A rounded ball of bone at one end of the thigh bone, or femur, moves or articulates inside a cup-like socket that is part of the pelvis. Articular cartilage, which is smooth and firm, lines the socket and covers the ball. Normal cartilage allows the ball to articulate or glide smoothly within the socket to give you full motion of the hip and movement without pain. Arthritis is a condition where the cartilage lining the hip joint wears out. The joint no longer moves smoothly without pain and discomfort. Mobility is usually affected as well. Patients with arthritis of the hip experience pain, particularly with activities such as walking, stair climbing, arising from the seated position, and prolonged standing. They also have difficulty with athletic activities involving quick changes in direction, and moving beyond a limited range of motion causes pain. The most common form of arthritis of the hip is degenerative or osteoarthritis. Trauma to the hip joint, such as fracture of the ball or socket, rheumatoid disease, or other types of systemic arthritis can lead to breakdown of the articular cartilage and degeneration of the hip joint. A sensation of grinding and popping can occur in the hip joint when the articular cartilage is worn, either partly or completely. One bone rubbing directly against the other produces pain. The first x-ray shows the normal ball and socket of the hip joint. There is a wide space between the ball and the socket, which is occupied by articular cartilage. This is a normal joint space. In the second x-ray, the ball is rubbing directly against bone. The space for the articular cartilage has been eliminated and the bones are in direct contact with each other because the articular cartilage is completely worn away. Moderating and modifying activity are important for reducing the symptoms of arthritis. This may mean walking less, particularly if you walk for exercise, and walking for a long time significantly increases your discomfort. It may also mean avoiding stairs. Certainly, you should avoid athletic pursuits that cause pain, such as running and court sports involving directional changes, which can cause significant discomfort. Although you may have to modify your activities, it is important to keep moving the arthritic joint to maintain range of motion and strength. Your doctor may prescribe formal physical therapy instruction. You can also use an exercise bicycle with a high seat position and little resistance. A water exercise program is an excellent way to build strength and gain motion while avoiding weight bearing across the painful arthritic hip. Some people benefit from the use of heat, although it is often not effective because the heat cannot penetrate to the hip, which is a very deep-seated joint. Ice may also be tried, although many people find it uncomfortable. External support, such as a cane or crutch, in the hand opposite the arthritic hip can be helpful for walking as it shifts the weight from the arthritic hip to the uninvolved hip. Along with these measures, oral medication can be of benefit. This medication usually begins with over-the-counter or non-prescription medications, including acetaminophen, ibuprofen, or naproxen. Once this medication is not effective in controlling discomfort, your doctor may prescribe non-steroidal medications. 
The use of nutraceuticals such as glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate may also be beneficial in moderate to severe osteoarthritis. Another treatment option is injection of cortisone into the arthritic hip joint to help decrease inflammation and therefore decrease pain. This measure, which can be employed several times a year, is temporary. How well it works and how long the effects last are unpredictable. Sometimes these injections require the use of a fluoroscope, which uses x-rays to create a moving image on a monitor so the doctor can make sure the needle is in the right place before injecting the medication. Arthritic disease of the hip is usually progressive. That is, it gets worse over time. Progression may not show on x-rays, but rather by increasing pain and incapacitation. Occasionally, x-rays may show a dramatic progression of arthritis, with substantial destruction of bone about the hip. In some instances, this can occur in a relatively short period of time. The measures just described are designed to allow an individual to live with an arthritic hip. If these measures become ineffective, you and your doctor may consider hip joint replacement. If you and your doctor decide the total hip joint replacement would be advantageous, you should fully understand the risks and benefits associated with the procedure. An artificial hip joint replaces your natural hip joint with one made of metal and plastic or ceramic that is pressed or cemented into place. The goal is to relieve pain and improve motion and function. Artificial joints can be very successful in achieving these goals. The question patients most frequently ask is, how long will the replacement last? The duration of an implant varies depending on your age, activity level, and many other factors. The more demand that is placed on the artificial joint, the greater the potential for wear and failure over time. Longevity may also be dependent on the type of material used for the artificial joint. There is certainly no consensus as to the best material for the articular surfaces placed in a hip joint. The best choice may depend on the age of the patient and the demand to be placed on the material. Talk to your doctor about the implant options that are best for you. With your new hip joint replacement, it is okay to walk, bike, golf, and play doubles tennis. Ultimately, someone who chooses to undergo hip joint replacement will have to accept some limits in physical activity. It is important to talk to your surgeon about your desires and anticipated demands before considering this procedure. Before your surgery, you will spend ample time with your doctor and the doctor's staff learning about normal and arthritic hip anatomy and discussing your specific hip problem. Your doctor will thoroughly examine your hip and offer you adequate time to ask questions about the surgical procedure, rehabilitation options, recovery time, and special needs you may have before and after surgery. It is important that you address any concerns you might have with your doctor before hip replacement. It is also important to discuss which of a number of possible surgical approaches your surgeon will be using for your operation. And it is important that your questions be answered before your surgery and that you have a thorough understanding of both the operation and potential risks and complications. Preparing for a hip replacement begins weeks before the actual surgery date. In general, your doctor may discuss the following with you. Autologous blood donation. While some total joint procedures do not require a blood transfusion, it is possible that you may need blood during or after surgery. You can donate your own blood before surgery. Dental examination. Dental procedures such as extractions and periodontal work should be completed before hip replacement surgery to reduce the potential for infection. Medications. Your doctor can advise you which over-the-counter and prescription medications should not be taken before surgery. Stop smoking to help reduce the risk of post-operative lung problems and improve healing. Lose weight. In patients who are overweight, losing weight will help reduce stress on the new joint. Laboratory tests. Blood test, urine test, an EKG or cardiogram 
and chest x-ray may be prescribed to confirm that you are fit for surgery. It is important to be in the best possible overall health to help promote the best possible surgical experience. Here are some exercises that your doctor may recommend. Low impact aerobic exercise. Swimming and riding a stationary bike are great low impact exercises that help build strength. Stop any exercise that causes increasing pain. Short arc knee extensions. Roll up several towels in a roll six to eight inches thick. Lay in bed with the towels under one knee. Bend the other knee. Keeping your knee on the towels, lift your foot to straighten the knee. Hold for a few seconds and lower the foot. Ankle pumps. While lying in bed, point your toes downward and then bring your toes back up towards your head, tightening your calf. Heel slides. Slide your heel along the bed, pulling your foot toward you as your knee bends. Straight leg raise. Start by tightening your quadriceps, the muscles in the front of your thigh. Then, with toes toward the ceiling, lift your leg 6 to 12 inches from the bed. Quadriceps sets. Lie on your back, legs straight. Tighten the muscle in the front of your thigh as you press the back of your knee toward the bed. Hold for a few seconds, then relax the leg. Standing knee bends. Stand while holding on to a steady surface, such as a table. Bend your knee as far as it will go comfortably. Hold for a few seconds and lower the leg. Increasing upper body strength is also important because of the need to use a walker or crutches after surgery. Bicep curls. In a sitting position, keep your elbow close to your body and your wrist straight. Bend your arm, moving your hand up to your shoulder, then lower slowly. Triceps extensions. Sit, leaning forward from the waist. Bend your elbow so that your forearm is parallel to the floor. Then straighten your elbow as you extend your arm behind you. Seated press-ups. Sit in a sturdy chair with armrests. With palms on the armrests, press down to lift yourself from the chair. Hold for three to five seconds. Bend your elbow slowly to ease back down. Talk to your doctor before starting any exercise program. And remember to call your doctor if you experience increased pain or swelling after exercise. Hip replacement helps hundreds of thousands of Americans each year to relieve their hip pain and get back to enjoying everyday activities. As with any surgical procedure, there are defined inherent risks that you should be aware of. Medical risks of hip joint replacement include infection, which can occur in the days or weeks after surgery. Infection can also occur at any time during the life of the artificial hip replacement if bacteria migrate to the joint through the bloodstream from another part of your body. It is recommended that you take preventive antibiotics after your operation for routine procedures such as dental work. Your doctor will let you know how long you need to keep taking them. It is important to follow these instructions. Infection of the hip after artificial hip joint replacement almost always requires additional surgery and prolonged use of intravenous antibiotics. Other medical risks of hip replacement surgery include blood clots involving the leg or lungs, complications from anesthesia, nerve or blood vessel injury to surrounding tissues, failure or delay of wound healing with loss of skin. A hip with multiple scars in previous operations is particularly at risk. Postoperative bleeding, possibly requiring blood transfusion. Heart attack. Stroke. Other problems may occur with the implanted joint itself over the life of the patient or lifetime of the implant. Although infrequent, these problems can occur and include implant loosening, thigh pain, especially in uncemented hips, 
dislocation, breaking or wearing out of the implant itself, reaction of the body to particles wearing off the implant, persistent restriction of motion, fracture around the implant following a fall, formation of extra bone around the artificial hip, unequal leg lengths. Unequal leg lengths after surgery are not uncommon. Despite careful measurement and assembly of the hip joint replacement, the diameters or lengths of the implant must often be modified to achieve a truly stable hip and to avoid or reduce the risk of dislocation. Initially, after hip joint replacement, a person may sense that their legs are different lengths, when they are in fact the same. This is the result of tightness around the joint and hip musculature. This goes away in the months after surgery. If leg length inequality is a persisting long-term issue, a shoe lift may be required. Before, during, and after surgery, your physicians and other medical professionals will take many steps to avoid any complications, performing various tests to ensure you can safely tolerate surgery. For example, you will be given a medication to thin your blood. This medication, either in oral or injectable form, helps to reduce the risk of a blood clot. You may need to take this medication for up to two or three weeks after the surgery. After your surgery, you may also have devices that compress your legs or feet to further reduce the risk of a blood clot. During and after your surgery, you will be given several doses of antibiotics to reduce the risk of infection. To begin the surgery, your physician will make an incision in the skin over your hip joint, cutting through the skin, soft tissue and muscle to access the hip. Once the hip is reached, the ball is dislocated from the socket and removed from the end of the femur with a saw. The socket, or acetabulum, is exposed. After measuring the size of the socket to guide accurate selection, the appropriate reamer, a cheese grater type device, is used to create a perfect hemispherical bone socket that matches the external shape of the acetabular cup. The cup is carefully positioned in the bony socket. This cup is held in place using a number of methods depending upon surgeon preference and your bone quality. These methods may include bone cement to hold the cup in place. Most cups are designed to allow bone to grow into the metal surface to hold the cup in place. These cups have a roughened or specially prepared surface, which is designed to allow ingrowth of bone into the metal itself. This type of fixation may be augmented by screws to help fix the cup in place while bone growth takes place. The inside of the femur, or thigh bone, is then cleared with various types of devices and a prosthesis is placed into the femur. A trial ball is placed on the top of the femoral stem and a plastic insert is placed into the cup. The hip joint is then articulated by placing the ball in the artificial socket. The hip is evaluated for the type and amount of motion it has and the stability of the joint, that is the inability of the ball to dislocate from the socket easily. Once the appropriate combination has been found, the ball is then placed onto the femoral stem and the final insert is placed into the cup. The leg is evaluated again for stability and mobility and leg length equality. Throughout the operation, numerous measurements and operative considerations are taken to equalize leg lengths. However, the primary goal is to achieve a stable, non-dislocating hip. Prior to final assembly of the total hip, leg lengths are again evaluated. The new implants will replicate your hip joint. Your physician will rinse out debris from the hip joint with sterile fluid and then close the wound in layers with stitches and or staples. A plastic drain may be placed in your hip and removed later. The purpose of the drain is to remove blood from the inside of the joint and tissues that might accumulate in the area after surgery. When you awaken from surgery, you will be in the recovery room. P. 
pain management after surgery is an important part of your operation and often one of the greatest concerns for patients. Your doctor will have talked to you about this before your operation. Pain management after surgery may be achieved by a variety of techniques, including type of anesthesia, patient-controlled injection of medication into their IV, and oral medication. After surgery, your physical therapist will show you how to properly get out of bed and begin walking with your walker or crutches. Your physical therapist will also teach you how to safely move with respect to your new hip, using the precautions directed by your surgeon based on the approach used to construct your hip joint replacement and the type and size of implants placed in your hip. Physical and or occupational therapists will also teach you how to safely negotiate stairs and how to get in and out of a car during the first few weeks after surgery. You will start post-operative therapy almost immediately, gradually moving from passive to active exercises, which will strengthen your hip. Your physical therapist will work with you on post-operative exercises, many of which will be the same as the pre-operative exercises in this program. Also, instruction in activities of daily living, such as showering and toilet usage, will be provided. Precautions taken to avoid dislocation vary depending on the surgical approach used to install the hip joint and the stability of your hip at the completion of surgery. These precautions will be individualized for you. You will be in the hospital three to four days. This may vary based on your progress. Your doctor and physical therapist will establish discharge goals, and once these goals are met, you will be discharged. Rehabilitation will continue either at your home, an outpatient facility, or in a rehabilitation facility. A word about airport security. Since your implant is made of metal, it will almost always set off the metal detector at airport security. In the era of heightened surveillance, almost all security checks no longer accept a document that states that you have a metal implant in place. You should inform the screener that you have in place an artificial hip and be prepared to be evaluated with a handheld detector. Hopefully this educational information has provided for you a more complete understanding of your knee problem as well as options for its management. Replacement surgery is done hundreds of thousands of times per year in the United States and is among the most predictable and successful of all operations in terms of decreasing pain and improving quality of life. But like all surgery, it is associated with inherent potential risks and complications. We have tried to describe these as well as the actual procedure in a manner that will help you when considering this procedure. As and as always, please discuss any questions or concerns with us. Thank you. The knee is a complex joint, which is composed of bones, cartilage, tendons, and ligaments. In the knee, the ends of two bones, the femur on top and the tibia below, are covered by a smooth, firm coating called articular cartilage. The back of the patella, or kneecap, is also covered with this smooth articular cartilage and slides against the front aspect of the femur. This cartilage allows the femur to move smoothly on the tibia and the kneecap to move smoothly on the front of the femur, or thigh bone, as the knee bends and as the thigh muscle contracts to allow you to carry out activities such as climbing stairs. This cartilage, when healthy, enables you to bend your leg at the knee easily and without pain. Arthritis is the condition where this cartilage wears out and the joint can no longer move effortlessly and without discomfort. Patients with arthritis often experience pain, especially with activities such as walking, stair climbing, and rising from a seated position. People with arthritis also often have limited motion of the knee and swelling involving the knee joint. The most common form of arthritis is degenerative or osteoarthritis, but trauma to the knee and rheumatoid disease or other types of systemic arthritis may also lead to breakdown of this articular cartilage and degeneration of the joint. A sensation of grinding occurs when the articular cartilage is worn, either partially or completely, 
which allows one bone to rub against the other and causes pain. Although cartilage cannot be seen on x-ray, you can see how wearing down of cartilage affects the space between the bones. In the first x-ray, note the wide, smooth space between the femur, or thigh bone, and the tibia, or shin bone. The space reflects healthy articular cartilage maintaining a normal joint space. In the second x-ray, note the femur is touching the tibia, which is creating a bone-on-bone -bone condition that occurs when articular cartilage is completely worn away. The third x-ray demonstrates a similar finding behind the kneecap when the cartilage behind the patella is worn, allowing the kneecap to contact the femur in a bone-on-bone -bone manner. Moderation and modification of activity are important for reducing the symptoms of arthritis. For example, you may need to reduce walking, particularly if you do it for exercise, and if walking a lot significantly increases discomfort. You may also have to avoid stairs, and certainly avoid athletic pursuits that can be painful, such as running and court sports. In particular, in the younger active individual, court sports that involve directional change can produce significant discomfort. Many people benefit from the use of heat or ice, applied in a safe manner and taking care to avoid skin damage. Individual preference for heat or ice varies. Many people also benefit from external support or compression, such as a neoprene knee sleeve or elastic bandage around the knee. Along with these methods for reducing discomforts, oral medication can also be of benefit. Over-the-counter medications, that is, medications you don't need a prescription for, are usually used first. These include acetaminophen, ibuprofen, or naproxen. Once over-the-counter medication is not effective in controlling discomfort, you may be given prescription non-steroidal medications. This will require physician evaluation. The use of nutraceuticals such as glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate may also be beneficial in moderate to severe osteoarthritis. In addition to oral medications, injections may be used. Occasionally, cortisone is injected into the arthritic knee to help decrease inflammation and therefore decrease pain. This measure, which can be employed several times a year, is temporary. The degree of relief provided and how long the effect lasts are both unpredictable. In addition to cortisone, a natural protein may be injected into the knee. This treatment involves a series of three or five injections which diminish pain for a variable amount of time. The effect usually lasts two to three months, but may be longer in some people. In general, this treatment can be repeated twice a year. Another option is a surgical procedure known as osteotomy, which shifts the weight from a diseased area to a non-diseased area of the knee. The procedure involves removing a wedge of bone, generally from the upper tibia, but sometimes from the distal end of the femur, to realign the lower extremity and move the weight-bearing axis to an area of the knee where the cartilage is normal. Younger, more active patients may be good candidates for osteotomy. Unfortunately, this procedure is unpredictable in terms of duration and degree of pain relief. Many patients who undergo osteotomy will later face knee joint replacement. Occasionally, the arthroscope is helpful in cleaning out the arthritic knee. This procedure is most effective in someone with significant mechanical catching and locking of the knee due to cartilage or meniscal tears in the knee. This procedure is very unpredictable for relieving arthritis pain and is generally not done only for pain relief. Arthritic disease in the knee usually gets progressively worse. Although the x-ray might not show worsening, the patient may experience increasing pain and incapacitation. Your doctor may order other imaging studies, such as an MRI, to look at other structures within the joint. The measures that have been described are designed to allow a person to live with their arthritic natural knee. If these treatment options become ineffective, the next step may be consideration of knee joint replacement. If you and your doctor decide that total knee replacement would be advantageous, 
you should completely understand the risks and benefits associated with the procedure. An artificial knee joint replaces your natural knee joint with one made of metal and plastic. The goal is to relieve pain and improve motion and function. Artificial joints can be very successful in achieving these goals. The question patients most frequently ask is, how long will the replacement last? The duration of an implant varies, depending on your age, activity level, and many other factors. The more demand that is placed on the artificial joint, the greater the potential for wear and failure over time. With your new knee joint replacement, it is okay to walk, bike, golf, and even play doubles tennis. Ultimately, someone who chooses to undergo knee joint replacement will have to accept some limits in physical activity. It is important to talk to your surgeon about your desires and anticipated demands before considering this procedure. Before your surgery, you'll spend ample time with your doctor and his or her staff learning about normal and arthritic knee anatomy and discussing your specific knee problems. Your doctor will thoroughly examine your knee and will offer you adequate time to ask questions about the surgical procedure, rehabilitation options, recovery time, and special needs you may have before and after surgery. It is important that you address any concerns you might have with your doctors before knee replacement. Preparing for total knee replacement begins weeks before the actual surgery date. In general, your doctor may discuss the following with you. Autologous blood donation. While some total joint procedures do not require a blood transfusion, it is possible that you may need blood during or after surgery. You can donate your own blood before surgery. Dental examination. Dental procedures such as extractions and periodontal work should be completed before knee replacement surgery to reduce the potential for infection. Medications. Your doctor can advise you which over-the-counter and prescription medications should not be taken before surgery. Stop smoking to help reduce the risk of post-operative lung problems and improve healing. Lose weight. In patients who are overweight, losing weight will help reduce stress on the new joint. Laboratory tests. Blood test, urine test, an EKG or cardiogram, and chest x-ray may be prescribed to confirm that you are fit for surgery. It is important to be in the best possible overall health to help promote the best possible surgical experience. Increasing upper body strength is important because of the need to use a walker or crutches after knee replacement. Strengthening the lower body is also key because increasing leg strength before surgery may reduce recovery time. Here are some exercises that your doctor may recommend to help speed your recovery. Low impact aerobic exercise. Swimming and riding a stationary bike are great low impact exercises that help build strength in your knee. Stop any exercise that causes increasing pain. Short arc knee extensions. Roll up several towels in a roll, six to eight inches thick. Lay in bed with the towels under one knee. Bend the other knee. Keeping your knee on the towels, lift your foot to straighten the knee. Hold for a few seconds and lower the foot. Ankle pumps. While lying in bed, point your toes downward and then bring your toes back up towards your head, tightening your calf. Heel slides. Slide your heel along the bed, pulling your foot towards you as your knee bends. Straight leg raise. Start by tightening your quadriceps, the muscles in the front of your thigh. Then, with toes toward the ceiling, lift your leg 6 to 12 inches from the bed. Quadriceps sets. Lie on your back, legs straight. Tighten the muscle in the front of your thigh as you press the back of your knee toward the bed. Hold for a few seconds, then relax the leg. Standing knee bends. Stand while holding on to a steady surface, such as a table. Bend your knee as far as it will go comfortably. Hold for a few seconds and lower the leg. 
Increasing upper body strength is also important because of the need to use a walker or crutches after knee replacement. Bicep curls. In a sitting position, keep your elbow close to your body and your wrist straight. Bend your arm, moving your hand up to your shoulder, then lower slowly. Triceps extensions. Sit, leaning forward from the waist. Bend your elbow so that your forearm is parallel to the floor. Then straighten your elbow as you extend your arm behind you. Seated press-ups. Sit in a sturdy chair with armrests. With palms on the armrests, press down to lift yourself from the chair. Hold for three to five seconds. Bend your elbows slowly to ease back down. Talk to your doctor before starting any exercise program and remember to call your doctor if you experience increased pain or swelling in your knee after exercise. The great majority of total knee surgeries are complication free and result in significant pain relief and restoration of mobility. However, as with any surgical procedure, there are defined inherent risks that you should be aware of. Medical risks of knee replacement surgery include infection, which may occur in the days or weeks after surgery. Infection can also occur at any time during the life of the artificial knee if bacteria migrate to the joint through the bloodstream from another part of the body. It is recommended that you take preventive antibiotics after your operation for routine procedures such as dental work. Your doctor will let you know how long you will need to keep taking them. Other medical risks of knee replacement surgery include blood clots involving the leg or lungs, complications from anesthesia, nerve or blood vessel injury to surrounding tissues, failure or delay of wound healing with loss of skin. A knee with multiple scars and previous operations is particularly at risk. Postoperative bleeding, possibly requiring blood transfusion, heart attack, stroke. Other problems may occur with the implanted joint itself over the life of the patient or lifetime of the implant. Although infrequent, these problems can occur and include loosening of the knee implant where it is fixed to bone, breaking or wearing out of the implant itself, problems with the kneecap or patella, including dislocation or fracture and or failure of that implant, swelling and continued pain and stiffness. It is important for anyone planning on a knee joint replacement to understand that an artificial knee is not a natural knee. Some people may not be able to squat or kneel as easily or as fully as they'd like. Also, your surgeon may not recommend that you do so. A person's legs may no longer be the same length after one-sided knee joint replacement, especially if there was a significant deformity before surgery, such as bow legs. Before, during, and after surgery, your doctors and other medical professionals will take many steps to avoid any complications, performing various tests to ensure you can safely tolerate surgery. For example, you will be given a medication to thin your blood. This medication, either in oral or injectable form, helps reduce the risk of a blood clot. You may need to take this medication for up to two or three weeks after the surgery. After your surgery, you may also have devices that compress your legs or feet to further reduce the risk of blood clot. During and after your surgery, you will be given several doses of antibiotics to reduce the risk of infection. To begin the surgery, your doctor will make an incision on the front of your knee, cutting through the tissue surrounding the muscles and bone. The kneecap, or patella, is rotated to the outside of the knee to help your doctor see the area where the implant will be placed. With the end of the thigh bone, or femur, now exposed, your doctor will use special cutting instruments to measure and make precise cuts of the bone. The end of the femur is cut into a shape that matches the corresponding surface of the metal femoral component. This component is then attached to the prepared end of the femur. Next, the shin bone, or tibia, 
is prepared with a flat cut on the top. The exposed end of the bone is sized to fit the metal and plastic tibial components. The metal component is then inserted into the bone. A plastic insert or bearing surface is then snapped into the tibial component. The femoral component will slide on this plastic as you bend your knee. If needed, the kneecap or patella is also cut flat and fitted with a plastic patellar component. Your surgeon may choose to use cement to help fix the implants on your bone. Your doctor will conduct several tests during the surgery to ensure the correct sized components are used to help you regain good balance and motion in your knee. Your doctor will rinse out the debris from your knee with sterile fluid and then close the wound in layers with stitches and or staples. A plastic drain may be placed in your knee to remove blood from the inside of the joint that can accumulate after surgery. The plastic drain will eventually be removed. When you awaken from surgery, you will be in the recovery room. Pain management after surgery is an important part of your operation and often one of the greatest concerns for patients. Your doctor will have talked to you about this before your operation. Pain management after surgery may be achieved by a variety of techniques, including various types of spinal anesthesia, nerve blocks, patient-controlled injection of medication into their IV, and oral medication. After surgery, you may be fitted with a CPM, or Continuous Passive Motion Machine. This device will automatically flex your knee while you are resting. Your surgeon will let you know whether you will be using this device, how much, and for how long. In the days following surgery, your condition and progress will continue to be closely monitored by your orthopedic surgeon, nurses, and physical therapists. Much time will be given to exercising the new joint, as well as deep breathing exercises to prevent lung congestion. Gradually, pain medication will be reduced, the IV will be removed, Diet will progress to solid food, and you will become increasingly mobile. Rehabilitation is an important part of your recovery. After surgery, your physical therapist will show you how to get out of bed properly and begin walking with your walker or crutches. It's important to know that your pain can be managed so you can effectively complete your post-op exercises. You will start post-operative therapy almost immediately gradually moving from passive to active exercises which will strengthen your knee. Your physical therapist will work with you on post-operative exercises, many of which will be the same as the pre-operative exercises in this program. Your physical therapist will also teach you how to safely negotiate stairs and how to get into and out of a car during the first few weeks after surgery. You'll be in the hospital three to four days. This may vary based on your progress. Your doctor and physical therapist will establish discharge goals, and once these goals are met, you will be discharged. Rehabilitation will continue either at your home, an outpatient facility, or in a rehabilitation facility. A word about airport security. Since your implant is made of metal, it will almost always set off the metal detector at airport security. In this era of heightened surveillance, Almost all security checks no longer accept a document that states that you have a metal implant in place. You should inform the screener that you have an artificial knee. Be prepared to be evaluated with a handheld detector. It is useful to wear loose-fitting clothing so that you can show your knee to the inspector if necessary. Hopefully this educational information has provided for you a more complete understanding of your knee problem as well as options for its management. Replacement surgery is done hundreds of thousands of times per year in the United States and is among the most predictable and successful of all operations in terms of decreasing pain and improving quality of life. But like all surgery, it is associated with inherent potential risks and complications. We have tried to describe these as well as the actual procedure in a manner that will help you when considering this procedure. As and as always, please discuss any questions or concerns with us. Thank you.